Good. That's quite an intro. Well, I got my pal uh, T Bone to uh, thank for doing all that. He's he's a wizard with not only the song but doing the visuals and uh, everything else. So uh, I got him to totally thank for doing all that. It's uh, it's funny to see all of the um, previous guests. You know, Phrase Kelly, Curran, Alex Larry. Heward, Alex Heward. Yes, Alex Heward. Previous. That's who you were on when you were on Triumph. You put him in as your name as Alex Heward. Oh, that's <laughs> right. I up. forgot about that. You're messing. You're messing up my my viewers, man. <laughs> it's all good. But here I got the the third party here coming on. Great. Rock on. Oh, look who it is. Hey, Brent. You're in a huge room of recorded material. <laughs> it's all an illusion. <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> that's cool. It's artwork by our buddy T Bone. Nice. Wow. Yeah. T-Bone is like the man. He, he is, is the man. He's doing the... all sorts of work for you guys. Well, totally. Awesome. And, uh, thank God he doesn't charge. <laughs> 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 Not yet anyways. But uh, hey, Brent, uh, thanks for, you know, just taking your Thursday night uh, to uh, wanting to hop on with us. Sure. And before we get into this crazy uh, conspiracy theory involving uh, Matthew Tripe, Let's talk about what you got going on right now, which is obviously your No Sleep to Subray podcast, which is already up to, I think, episode 237, yes. I believe. And also um, your Thursday night record club, speaking of Alex Heward, which I will tell you right now, it's become a, a family favorite here at the Williamson's here oh, in Thunder Bay you. on the big screen every Thursday night. Um, on the big screen. That is so cool. Here yeah, we get it. We get it. We get a kick out of you guys. You guys got some great banter going between both of you. Um, and uh, you know what? For maybe the few people who don't know about it, can you give us the background on um, how it came to be and what your whole deal with that is? Sure. The premise of the show, uh, Alex and I, Alex hosted a podcast, still does, release day series. Uh, I host uh, Sudbury. And we had been talking for a long time about doing something together but we could never really figure it out. Now, the, the funny thing is that Alex is, is 20 years my junior. He's like 31 or 32. And so we would joke around about that. Uh, he's a huge music fan, so am I, but we come from different generations. And so uh, we talked about, I think that he, he had approached me because he listened to my podcast and he said, hey, like Andy Curran uh, brought an Aerosmith song in. And it was round and round, I believe. And he said, uh, I love that song, you know, and I, I kind of, I don't really know that much about Aerosmith. And I said, there's our opportunity right there. So what we can do is set up a show where I, the old man, introduce the young kid to, you know, music of my generation and before, like the classic rock stuff, because he loves rock. But he just, you know, I said to him, the Black Crows, he's like, the Counting Crows? And I said, no, <laughs> the Black Crows. And he's like, oh. And so, but he'd never, he never heard them before. So I thought like, this is gold, right? So we set up the show and uh, basically the show in essence is I give him an album at the beginning of the week, he listens to it. And then at the end of the week, every Thursday at nine o'clock, uh, he tells me what he thinks of the album. And we go through the record, we go through the tunes and, and, um, you know, talk about, uh, you know, stories related to the, the album and that sort of thing. And it's pretty entertaining. I mean, it's, 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 it's so much fun to do because he's got a great attitude and, you know, um, we have good chemistry. We have, we have a good laugh on the show and, yes. uh, it's just, it's, it's fun. Thursday night record club. It's called. And only on YouTube. So hit uh, Brent YouTube. Jensen music at YouTube, put her down on the, throw them down a subscription and they'll, they'll hit you up every Thursday night at nine. 
please subscribe. Yeah, we're, uh, we're, you know, we had a clip. I don't know if you saw this clip. Um, we talked about the cool thing. The cool thing about the show is that we just kind of go off on tangents and talk about, you know, things that happen. We're, we're doing the Rolling Stones XL on Main Street. And I, I told the story because it just came to me about Neil Peart meeting uh, Charlie Watts for the first time at the Saras Fest. Mm. And I thought nothing of it. It just kind of came out and um, Alex made a clip of it. And the clip, believe it or not, uh, is now at 46,000 views. Wow. Whoa. I know. I, it, just, uh, it just caught fire. I don't know what happened. Um, and counting. It's, it's crazy. So, yeah, Good very fortunate. Guys. Yeah, but we're, um, you know, we, we want to get the show out there. So That yeah. was a great episode, but I really liked last week's uh, Black Crows of Morica, my favorite. Uh, so, <laughs> me too kudos on that episode that was fantastic me too thank you very much it was it was fantastic for sure but i think what almost stole the whole show was the the puppet show at the end <laughs> <laughs> i you know it's funny i, I completely forgot about that and uh, i didn't <laughs> we, we we do the show at 10 at night on a thursday and um you know it, get, it gets a bit goofy and uh you know alex cuts a lot of stuff out right so he does all the editing for the show okay. and sometimes i'll forget i'll forget stuff and he'll give me a clip that like didn't appear on the show and it's like oh i totally forgot that we talked about that or said that and the, the hand puppets thing i'd completely forgotten uh a day before he sends me the show and i give him a couple of like facts and stuff like that and and my input and i saw it and i actually started laughing out loud and uh i did, i had completely forgotten about it so i was kind of looking forward to that um that little segment of the show coming up so. yeah and also that and also the other episode i can't remember which one it was but when he uh smashed out his teeth on the glass and had to go to the dentist <laughs> that's right that, right there folks that's must see tv somebody, on thursday night yeah somebody get me a dentist yeah <laughs> no, it, was, it, was, it was a van halen album too i think it was, it was van halen too so it's like somebody get me a doctor, somebody get me a dentist. Somebody get me a dentist. So, so Brent, the mm. reason we wanted to bring you on tonight was not only to talk to you and say hey to you, but it was also <laughs> to get into the whole story that happened back in the, the mid-80s about uh, a fellow claiming that he was actually brought in to replace the real Nikki Six and Motley Crue. Yes. And um, it's kind of funny. I recall hearing about it back then. But then I kind of forgot about it until I read Chapter Four. Frankie goes to Hollywood. Oh wow! Look at all those books. <laughs> so, uh, and it refreshed me. And I thought, yeah, I remember reading about it back in uh, Kerrang. So um, I'll let you boys. Take it. Whoa! Oh, nice. You got the actual issue. Both of them. Are you kidding? So yeah, so this is uh, this is March, I believe. Yeah, this is March 12, nineteen eighty eight. Was when it was was when it, the story broke. It was a guy named Ed Esposito. He's an American journalist, and he got wind of the story. And I think that what happened, we'll, we'll get into this, but Matthew Tripe released the story to the press. Ed, Ed Esposito uh, sent a note to Kerrang and said, "I don't know if you guys know about this, but there's a very weird. This is the this is the story. It says Nikki Six shock." And so it's just a story that, and this is how I first heard about it. And I read it and I thought like, this is bizarre, but there was this, uh, let's see if I can find it here. Yeah, here it is. Uh, a center fold kind of uh, feature on it. And it just kind of tells the story and shows some pictures of, you know, Nikki six and Matthew tripe and that sort of thing. So in essence, um, this Matthew Tripe character said that he replaced Nikki Six from, I think it was July 1983 to April 1984, under the premise of the real Nikki Six, whose name was Frank Ferrano, or Ferrana, uh, got into a car accident and separated his shoulder, broke his shoulder or something. So he was, he was unable to uh, perform in the band, and Doc McGee had this idea, because the band was kind of gaining momentum and doing really well, uh, decided that he would not wait around for, for Frankie and he would insert um, someone else into the, into the band. And that happened to be Matthew Tribe, allegedly. Uh, he went to jail because he was uh, a bit of a jackass. And then they brought this, this Frankie guy back in, apparently, the real Nikki Six, and they continued on. But it's very interesting. I mean, it's a conspiracy theory. And, and you know, I, 
these things are like the Loch Ness monster, right? You you don't have any real proof, but you kind of you've seen a picture, or your brother's cousin told you he saw it, or something like that. And uh, it's fascinating. We we love these things, right? We we romanticize these things. So I kind of got into it, and I bought the second magazine, uh, and it really right here. Um, they interviewed Matthew Tribe actually. And he provides he provides these very wild details about all the about all the the specific things that happened during that time, and the thing is, he uh, is not he, he's not a very bright person. He he makes points in a very unsophisticated way, and you that doesn't help his credibility, right? He doesn't um, I don't know. There's a lot of there's a lot of inconsistencies time wise, um, logic wise, that sort of thing. But still, the thing that really gets me about this, and I don't know about you guys, is the pictures. The, mm. the pictures are hard to explain away. The, the pictures make it difficult to ignore. And what I mean by that, there's two things. So the facial structure of Nikki Six before this happened is very, he's, he's very kind of gaunt and his, like his jaw is sharp and his, like his chin protrudes on this sort of thing. Um, Matthew Tripes did not. And so they take you through a series of pictures and apparently he toured with the band during theater of pain. And when you look at the previous, you look at Frank Ferrano, um, he's got that sharp jaw, the cut jaw. And then they show two pictures that Matthew, Matthew Tripe claimed was him. And he's got a round face, a very round face. And you talk about drinking and bloating and that sort of thing, but it's more than that. It's, it's, he looks different. It's very, very odd. And there's a picture of him with Motley Crue's tour manager. I think his name is Richard Fisher. Mm. Why would he why would he be in that picture? And he's got that that striped outfit, the black and white striped outfit that Nikki Six wore in the picture. Mm. Very peculiar, right? The other thing is the height difference. So they show Motley Crue band photos. Nikki Six has heels on, but he's way taller than Vince Neil standing beside him. Uh, in another photo on the Theater of Pain tour, when they're taking their bow at the end of the show, neither of them are wearing heels and they're almost the same height. <laughs> but then they go to a girls, girls, girls after this guy, Matthew Tripe was gone and Nikki Six again, no heels on either. He's taller again, a lot taller. Mm -hmm. Very strange. No Photoshop back then. No, it, it, that's it, right? There's no Photoshop back then. Mm -hmm. That's what I thought. That's funny because I, I thought about that too. There's no alteration. And, and there's a lot of other... Oh, I'm sorry. Continue. No, sorry, uh, Brent. And the thing back then, like, you know, social media back then was non-existent. Yeah. And our social media back then for us was buying the magazines like you, buying Krang reading about it because I think the Krang writer, John Houghton said that, you know, they had to act fast on it. They didn't want to lose the story and they only had two weeks to do it on typewriters. Yeah. Right. So yeah. they didn't, they didn't have the time to verify any like backstories on anybody. They just kind of like threw it out there and right. let it roll. So, you know, there was no blabbermouth back then. There was no Twitter. It right. wasn't like instant, like, hey, this guy's saying he's Nikki Six, and then it's squashed tomorrow. Exactly. This went on for years. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it's funny because, you know, Doc McGee wouldn't talk about it for the longest time. Mm. Doug Thaller uh, would, and he spoke to somebody at Kerrang specifically. I can't remember who it was. Could have been Houghton or Houghton. Um, and said, he's full of shit. And... Um, you know, it's not true. Obviously, it's a huge fabrication. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, but McGee just kind of shrugged his shoulders and said, this guy's a lunatic or whatever. He didn't offer a formal comment. And none of the guys in Motley Crue ever wanted to say anything about it either for some reason, especially Nikki Six. Never well, spoke in your, about him. In your book, I know you said when you met him at the Heroin Diaries uh, signing, mm. had that thought in the back of your head, do I go there with this? <laughs> I know. 
I was I, uh, inquiring minds want to know, right? Well, of course, yeah, fair enough. Yeah. I will say I did read an interview with Nikki Six in Hit Parader magazine where he did address the tripe issue, but oh. Hit Parader were also notorious for fabricating interviews. Um, you might recall they fabricated an interview with Sebastian Bach after the bottle incident that was used against him as evidence in court. Yeah. Um, so I wouldn't take that as gospel. But in the interview that I recall, he described tripe as fat and he had all the tattoos in the wrong places. Oh, interesting. that's what I recall. I unfortunately gave away all my magazines uh, a long time ago and I don't have my primary source anymore, but it would have been Hit Parader because that was my book that I bought all the time. You know, it's funny, Mike, I bought that one too, but um, I, you know, the stories were kind of a joke for me because it was, you know, the lead writer was a guy named Andy Setcher. Yeah. Right. And if you remember um, the Get in the Ring song by Guns N' Roses, you get into a bit of yeah. a scrape with uh, Axl Rose about something he wrote. Yeah. But I just found those, those the, the writing was not great. I mean, the, the pictures for Hit Prater uh, and Circus were great. You know, they had great, you know, kind of full page stuff you put in your locker in high school and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But I always went to Kerrang for the real facts and, and the writing, you know? Yeah. I just thought the quality was a lot um, kind of higher. So, Unfortunately. Like, yeah. You summed it up best there, their, their quality of writing mm -hmm. and they were like parting while they wrote these stories. I mean, they wrote it, they took their job serious, but they also delivered it in a slightly less serious tone like it was an easy read i mean it almost made you the reader almost feel like you're the interviewer right Whereas, like you said with circus and hip prater magazines yeah sure they were great for the hanging pictures in your lockers it's high school but the the stories there is just no real substance to them like i think you even mentioned in your book that they were just basically um uh record company handlers I, I kind of felt that way. You know, it was always like magnum right. opus. Yeah. You know, they, they used these like very That was all the time. Every album was like, the magnum every, opus. It was, so, yeah. it, was silly. it was silly to me, right? It yeah. was just kind of silly. So and, Cream cream and Krang were, you know, what you wanted to read. Yeah. Hip Prater and Circus were what you wanted to look at. Right. Yeah. And every, and I remember even buying Circus, I remember, remember like when, uh, but Iron Maiden or Molly Crew or Kiss or ACDC, whatever hit the road, they'd say, you know, live report from on the road with the new Iron Maiden tour. And then you would flip to that article. It'd be a review of the current tour, but the pictures would be from the previous tour. And it'd be like, oh, for sakes, I can't believe I got hosed three bucks again. You know? I know. <laughs> yeah. So, so the worst was Iron Maiden. So they would do that with Iron Maiden all the time. And if you're yeah. an Iron Maiden fan, you know that on the Peace of Mind tour, uh, Dickinson wore those kind of uh, those those tight pants that were um, they weren't they were red. He wore a pair of red pants with a leopard skin shirt and that big uh, kind of skull bell buck or belt buckle, right? Mm -hmm. You remember that? But then he started wearing these Harlequin pants. Harlequin jester, style. kind of jester yeah. pants. Yeah. Remember that? Right? Yeah. yeah. But he, he stopped. When, when, when Power Slave came around, he, he, he changed his wardrobe. And so they would keep printing those pictures. <laughs> and I thought, like, they're just recycling pictures now because they can't get a guy into the shows, I guess. I don't know. I don't know what happened. But, um, yeah, it was, it, it was redux quite a bit. Yeah, I recall that with a lot of articles. You'd see Kiss pictures from the previous tour, same with Motley Crue. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But it was the only magazine really that was available at the convenience store was Hit Parader. So oh, I, had really? a, I, I had a huge stack of them. And you're I right. Had, the pictures were great. I had I had them all. I, I bought it religiously as well. I bought that one. I bought um sometimes cream. I bought circus, but all for the pictures from my locker. That was it. You know, I was into Metallica back then and they started taking some really great pictures of James Hatfield. And Nikki Six, and and the, they all went into my locker, but I never cut my Kerrangs up. You know, these are all intact. Look at this one. Sean Kelly would love this one. Oh my God, Lee Aaron, Zodiac Mind Warp, Vinnie Vincent, and these are these are ridiculous. Like I was just looking through these before the show started, and the ads for, um, you know, the records like Sanctuary, if you remember that, Refuge Denied, like, you know, now released, like it's new record and stuff like that. Very cool. This one is the one I talk about in No Sleep Till Sudbury. This is the magazine 
that I was reading on the bus when I was driving to, when I was on my way to Massey. Remember that? I think it's yeah. like chapter yeah. six or whatever. This yeah. is the actual copy right here. I still have it um, that I took with me. Wow. You're, yeah. s you're sitting on a gold mine with those. <laughs> They're in great shape. I've got, I've got a million of them too. I've, I've still got them. What's your address again? <laughs> 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 right, right. You but, know what um, confused me, Brent? What? I'd open up my Hit Parader magazine mm -hmm. and there'd be an ad for the new album. I'm going to give you a specific example. Mm. The new album, Open Up and Say Ah by Poison, featuring uh -huh. the hit Good Love. And oh. I'm like, I never heard of that song. And I, it always kind of struck me as odd that they would announce this new album and they would have featuring the hit of a, you know, it's a song that's not even out yet. So how exactly. is it a hit? It always confused me. Yeah, well, that's like that's Hit Parader kind of uh, you know leading you on, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah very, very, so. very creative. But back to uh, uh, Tripe, he, you know, when I read, I read your obviously you reread uh, chapter four in your No Sleep the Sudbury book, and I also should also mention that um, Thank on your you. podcast. Um, episode i think it was 164 you did a bit of a deep dive into yeah. the whole motley crew mm. uh, razzle vince neal fallout and matthew tripe as well and uh you know it amazes me that the timeline given by him this is a guy who says yeah yeah i'm in i'm in motley crew and then he commits armed robbery <laughs> yes exactly <laughs> so so his story apparently was that his buddy did it and he was the kind of driver and he didn't know what was going to happen so he was in the car with this guy they they went and got cigarettes or booze or whatever it was he waited in the car his buddy went in and put a knife to the guy's throat tried to jack the register and uh the cops came and dude ran away and tripe was the only guy left there now whether or not you believe that is you know your prerogative but that was his story yeah. He, he went to jail for a bit of a stretch by that. So who knows? And that's what I mean. I mean, his credibility is very suspect. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff. But on the on the other hand, there's a lot of interesting, like, you know, like, the, do you guys know about the Sicky Nicks, Nicky Six thing? No. You listen to your uh, podcast, yeah. So I... when you, when you um, publish songs, you know, the, the, there are oh, organizations right. like ASCAP and SOCAN, um, yeah. that govern, you know, artists getting royalties and making sure they get royalties. So when you uh, set up a publishing company for yourself as a songwriter, you name it something, right? So it might be, you know, Deke Music or, or Ladano Tunes or whatever it is. Um, but Nikki Six, I, I think they set it up as Nikki Six Music, right? Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, um, and I, I checked this and it, 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 it's, it's valid. It was Nikki Six Music for a long time, and then on Girls, 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 the credit is Sicky Nick's music. And someone asked him why that is, and he said, "Well, that's to keep track of who wrote what." Hmm. So, be because he claimed he wrote a bunch of songs, he claimed that on Girls, 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 he wrote "You're All I Need" two years before that, and he submitted. Uh, handwritten lyrics that were very similar. They were different, just different enough. Um, uh, but, you know, two years before, and they kind of, you know, they're saying they were going to chemically test, you know, the date, like they're going to date test them somehow. I don't know how you do that. But he submitted these apparently sometime before, and then they pop up on Girls, Girls, Girls as Sicky Nick's music, which kind of, you know, kind of makes you wonder, right? And there's the conspiracy theory. Yeah. Well, was it a stick or was it the Loch Ness Monster? <laughs> Who knows? Or was yeah. it Matthew Tripe? <laughs> well, this, see, this is, it's, it's fun, right? So my position on this is it probably didn't happen, but it's kind of fun to think about. Oh, Rick, yeah. That's why yeah. we're, that's why I brought you guys on tonight to talk about it because hmm. it is an interesting theory. And, you know, I, I go, I know I talked about it off the top of the show about, you know, the eighties where there's no social media. I mean, it's really no different than somebody saying, Oh, you know, I, I saw Elvis in Thunder Bay eating at Burger King. Right. right? And you remember those Elvis sightings just went bonkers. So oh, yeah. when you hear stuff like this, 
at our age, it's like, yeah, you know, that's just how it rolled back then. But, you know, it, it definitely makes for an interesting story. And I mean, he, I kind of laughed when uh, Tripe says, you know, I basically wrote the theater of pain album, but I didn't write home sweet home because, you know, that's kind of a, a wimpy song. Yeah. Or, yeah a sissy that's song. Right. Or whatever it was. And <laughs> it's like, yeah. Yeah, okay, man, it's now you're getting a little longer. See, that's, a, that's what I mean. I, he kind of takes it a bit too far. He also said that instead of smoking in the boys room, they were supposed to do Mississippi queen. So wow. he, he and Mick Mars apparently would jam that together. And that was the tune that they were supposed to play. And then someone kind of piped up and said, I don't want to do that anymore. You know, smoking would be a better idea. And uh, eventually it just came to that. But apparently, you know, if Tribe had had wet his way and he was actually, you know, kind of truthful, um, we would be hearing a, a motley cover of Mississippi Queen on Theater Pain. There's an alternate universe out, out there where that's the case. <laughs> <laughs> like sliding doors. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, I'm kidding, man. Yeah. You know, when, yeah. when this first happened, when I was younger and reading this in the magazines, when I heard this, I, I like, I was not a theater of pain fan. I was a, I was a, a, a show the devil and girls, girls, girls fan, but I didn't like the middle mm -hmm. album. So I was okay. like, maybe it is true. And it might explain why I don't like that album. Maybe it wasn't written oh. by, you know, for me, I was like grabbing onto that conspiracy theory and thinking it might explain something about what that album is isn't doing for me you know right but of course you know as time went on it became clear that tripe was uh they they kind of they, they kind of what were there lawsuits going on yes but he disappeared basically so he yeah so <laughs> what happened was he uh he joined a some kind of he joined the temple of set or something like that he joins or he joined some sort of religious organization after he allegedly got tossed from Motley Crue. And then I think he went back to jail for a little while, but he died in 2014. He was 51. Oh, timely question. He go. died um, in 2014. He was 51 and he died of liver failure, surprisingly enough. Hmm. Um, so yeah, uh, like who, who knows, right? If anything, he's immortalized they say that 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 Motley Crue outtake track "Say Yeah" is written about tripe and the whole situation oh. that went on. At least that's what I gathered from the Hit Prater article that I read. Now, here's the other thing: if those Hit Prater articles were largely fabricated, how the heck did they get their hands on a song title like "Say Yeah," which later appeared on Supersonic and Demonic Relics? You know? Mm, yeah. Um, did Did Hit Prater take this topic on? Did they write about this? I. I have it in my memory that I had one issue where they did address it with six mm. and it would have been around the feel good era because yeah. say, yeah, is a feel good out outtake. And okay. I remember him describing the song. He's like, Oh yeah, it's a real heavy grinding, heavy song. And then when it, I, when I actually heard it, I was disappointed because it wasn't as heavy as I was expecting. It wasn't even that good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, you know, but, but Krang, you know, like going back to Krang, they, they kind of were in on that stuff. I mean, case in point, I, I think it was, uh, I guess, uh, John Houghton who wrote about it in Kerrang. And then um, a few years later, who's he interviewing other than Nikki Six for, I guess, Dr. Feelgood. And the first thing Nikki Six said to him was, you kind of write shitty things about me. Oh. <laughs> really? That's, uh, yeah, that's kind of a, what a way to start an interview. Like, how long? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I I read that at the the classic rock uh, website. Yeah, I was like, oh. little 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 introductory there. So he obviously knew what was going on. Nikki Six with in regards to uh, in regards to that. So yeah. I would I would I would I would love for him to kind of come out and say this is so. I kind of think that if something like this did happen, it happened on a very small scale. And it's possible that perhaps for a very, very, very short time, maybe just a select number of dates, they pop somebody else in there, mm -hmm. right? That facial thing would be explained. The height difference would be explained. But I want to know. I think there is something to it. 
I don't think it's as elaborate as, as tribe, you know, said, but I think, I think that I kind of, I don't know. I kind of want to, but again, maybe I just want to believe it, you know? <laughs> yeah. Like the Loch Ness monster, same deal. You want to believe oh, it. Well, I do. I want to see it. Right? I want to see aliens. I want to shake Jesus Christ's hand. Yeah. Am I ever going to? No. Well, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, in your book, I mean, you refer to um, Nikki Six, and it, and it's true. To uh, he was basically the pioneering Paris Hilton of glam metal. <laughs> that, that's a great. That's a great line, man. <laughs> he has. He has to like admit that too. And I, I said in the book, I think I said he was someday he will admit to that that he 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 was a big Bowie fan, right? So he yeah. understood what it meant to manufacture things. Um, and he understood, you know, audience appeal and that sort of thing. He, he built that band around um, a visual appeal. He really did. You know, Vince Neil was like, you know, Tommy Lee said, Hey, he can do a great Robin Zander. That was a thing. And he's like, does he look good? Yeah, he does. Okay. We'll get him in the band. So it didn't matter that he couldn't sing. He looked good. Mick Mars could play. You needed, if you're going to be a, a hard rock kind of, you know, glam hair band kind of, you know, you need a decent guitar player. And that's why Mick Mars, I don't, I don't know if you guys knew this. He was 34 when he yeah, joined yeah. that band. Yeah. Tommy Lee was like, he, I think he just turned 19. Yeah. Can you, could you imagine being yeah. in a band as a 19 year old yeah. with a dude who's 34? Yeah. That would be like playing with your dad. <laughs> <laughs> it would be right. like it would, it would wouldn't it? it would be. Like, that's my dog, by the way. Oh, that's all right. Hey, good security system. He promised me that he was going to be quiet. But you know, another quiet. smart thing Nikki did, and I, I'm saying Nikki because I undoubtedly he's the the visual director. But mm. change the image on every album. Change the logo on every album. You know, different yeah. hair, different clothes. The makeup might be slightly different from album to album until they drop. Uh, you know, very smart. He was like keeping track of what bands like Kiss did. Yep, that's a that's a Bowie thing, right? Is and it? that's what I, you know, I made that point about Motley Crue. People think Motley Crue showed the devil is heavy metal, but it's kind of, you know, and, and I don't say this with disrespect. It's kind of pretend heavy metal. It's 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 um it's fabricated. It sounds good. I like it. I listen mm -hmm. to it. Still, I love the record. Yep. You know, but it's not real. It's Nikki Six attracting attention. That's what Shout at the Devil is. I know that breaks people's hearts to hear, but it's true. That is the and I want him to, to admit that one day. I know he never will. But the I want is, him to. That that might make it that might I'm I'm not passing judgment here. That might make it not art, but it doesn't make it not good. It That's is right. Good. It is exactly. good. You know what makes it good, Mike? It makes it good that people actually like it. That's what makes it good, right? So it doesn't matter that it's not artistically sophisticated. It doesn't matter that it's not technically great. If someone likes it, then it's viably good in some yeah. way. That's what makes it good, right? People like Guar. <laughs> do you know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, it's it, Motley Crue is a lot different. I do. I like. I like that record. It's not real heavy metal, but I like it. Well, yeah, and I mean, when Shout at the Devil came out, I was just turning 16. So I still remember to this day, you know, bringing that, bringing it home. And, you know, like Nikki Six said at the time, he was able, he was a salesman. He we're, not telling, we're not we're not saying worship the devil. Yeah. Shout at the devil could be your, your parents, your teachers, your boss. Shout at them. So they're all devils. And I was like, oh, okay. And then you, you know, I remember dropping the, the needle on the groove and in the beginning, Good, always oh, over, and I'm like, <gasps> you know where that comes from? No, Diamond D Diamond Dogs. You ever listen oh, to? Yeah, no kidding. You ever listen to the beginning of Diamond Dogs? So that's no, like that's like. A, <laughs> listen, so listen to that, Mike, and and okay. like it will it will clear up some things for you because you know I, I made the Bowie reference before. Like Nikki Six was a Bowie file. He and that's why this whole like look at the career. Like so, they were punks. Too fast for love. Then they were like a full metal band, right? Then Theater of Pain came out and they were glam, mm -hmm. like sweet, right? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, they were bikers or girls. Like that's, <laughs> that's a that's a Bowie takeoff. Like it, it, it truly is. It's like, you know, what should we do next? What would Bowie do? 
and again, I don't say that disrespectfully, but no. that's that's what happened. Now I am gonna check out that Bowie record for sure. Yeah, I well, hey, man, if, if you if you're gonna copy somebody, he's he's the guy, right? May as well. Yeah, yeah. No, that's it. That's that's totally. I never knew that. So, mm -hmm. but I mean, every, everybody, yeah, everybody copies everybody, and you know what? And I I've gone off on it before where I always spun it, whereas Nikki Six was following trends, but not starting trends like case in point shout at the devil like in around that time frame maybe the year before yeah you know, iron maiden number of the beast all right so that took off in sales and got maiden on the map so if you get see if you're sitting there writing a record well what's currently selling mm -hmm. devil let's push the devil and then theater oh, yeah. aim like you said let's you know glam you know the music of la was starting to get really glammy so you okay. know, he hopped on that, and then, like you said, they went to the leather look for girls, 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 right? A lot so, of denim, a lot of denim. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. yeah smart businessman. You know? No, he was. He he understood his his audience. That's yeah. the thing. He did understand that, and that's a good point. Like he kind of he you know the difference between he and Bowie is that Bowie almost knew what people wanted before they knew what they wanted. But six kind of anticipated that people wanted something and then he gave it to them. And it worked because we all bought the records. Right. And I'll tell you, man, that guy was all over my locker in high school. I love Nikki Six. Love. He looked cool. My, it's funny you should mention the height thing because uh, I remember when we were kids watching the Pepsi have Power Hour in the basement. My sister loved the video for, um, I guess it was Too Young to Fall in Love, the one where mm. they're kind of doing kung fu fighting that's right and she loves the scene where nikki six stands up and he just towers you know he's, he's him and tommy and then the other two guys are down here see yeah exactly and that's that's the height thing that you mentioned is that he and tommy really towered over the other two guys they did absolutely yeah and mick okay. mars was looking to collect his pension check by then anyways <laughs> that poor guy like imagine what that would be like you guys so these guys are like you know 19 and 22 and you're 34 you're trying to keep up with these dudes on the road, right? Yeah. Every night they're getting blasted, drinking like a case of beer each or whatever it is. And you're like, holy crap, I've already done probably all this. Probably going like this. Like just hiding, right? Do it, yeah. Now, apparently he was like a massive boozer as well. Like he had this yeah. thing called Mick Aid, if you guys remember. Yeah. He would have this, this stuff that was, I don't even know what was in it, but it was mixed. And it was like, the big joke was that it was like Gatorade, but there was booze in it. But it wasn't Gatorade. It was He called it Mick Aid. And it was written on the bottle and he had that ready kind of, you know, on his side of the stage all the time. But yeah, tough gig for Mick Mars, man. I recall in the dirt, um, he was talking about them staying at a beach house uh, at the time of Vince's car accident. And he was so drunk, so blasted that he thought he was dead and people were mourning him. And he was like walking around as a ghost. Um, it's a bizarre chapter. Could you imagine <laughs> Like that state of inebriation. I can't. <laughs> think about that. You think you're dead and you're a spirit walking yeah. around among other people. That's how bomb these guys used to get. Like it was legendary. And he you know? had his back problem even back then. It was causing him pain. It wasn't to the point that it is today, but it was causing him pain. So yeah. he's dealing with that on top of it. Yeah. His yeah. bones were literally fusing together. Yeah. That's awful. Yeah. And I, I remember being in um, high school in the mid 80s and uh, I remember our library would get Rolling Stone magazine. And I think that was the first mm. place I ever read that That's they cool. outed Mick Mars's age because oh, in their, really? in their, their little news tidbit, they, as somebody at Rolling Stone, I guess, dug around and found a guy who used to jam with Mick Mars in White Horse. bar bands in wherever. Yeah. And, uh, so I guess somebody said, well, you know, Motley Crue, you know, their, their ages, you know, they're saying that Mick Mars is like 25, a few years older. And this guy's like, no way, man. I was playing with Mick Mars 10 years ago in the mid seventies. Yeah. You know, I was, like, I was like, what? So I took that Rolling Stone 
went into a little cubicle and went <laughs> and so oh. I ripped the page out. I thought, I need this as proof. Hey, you go and check this out. You know, that's so great. Yes. Yeah, so. That's so funny. Yeah. No, it had Bob Deal, right? Yeah. And yeah. Uh, and Nikki Six re- yeah. like recruited him because he was he was a great player, but he he was um it's like when when hockey teams get veterans around the playoffs, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, that 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 there's something to that as well. Like he kind of brought him in because he he'd already been around. He'd been around the block several times. He toured the world with with Whitehorse, but they never really took off. And yeah. you know, he figured he could kind of glam them up a little bit. You know, it's funny because looking at um, the show to the devil pictures and stuff like that, I was like, okay, so Vince Neil, yeah, that makes sense. Nikki Six looks really cool. Tommy Lee also really cool. Who's this like other dude? He looks like uh, like one of the monsters. Yeah, you know? like a he kind of just leaves all like you know, kind of decrepit, and he had his head down all the time. He just looked like really bitter, you know. <laughs> but that's why. Yeah, exactly. I remember we we used to sit around, and, you know, because we always thought, you know, Mick Mars was a, a good guitar player, but Mm. It didn't seem to really fit in with, like you said, it was an age difference of he looked yeah. a lot older than the other guys. So we kept saying, you know, at the time, Billy Idol, Rebel Yell was a big record. And we were thinking, yeah. hey, you know, Stevie Stevens would look the part of totally. Mon- yeah. Jakey yeah. Lee. You know, like we always yeah. had these our own conspiracy theories about getting these other guys to look more like the the look would fit Mo- oh. the image. Yeah. So... Like a guy like Warren D. Martini. Yeah, right? like any of those guys. Yeah, any like, of those dudes would yeah, look really like, amazing. That's another yeah. guy who looked really cool and could play like the wind, right? Yeah. Yeah. But I'm going to tell you something. If you guys watch footage, and I'm sure you both have of the U.S. Festival, the US Festival. Yeah. Um, Mick Mars kills. He was so good, man. He was so steady and so solid during that show. Both he and Tommy Lee held that thing down. Yeah, they did so well, like note for note. Yeah. That's so, cool. you know, thank God they were there. You know, Steve Vai it's is a Mick Mars well. fan. Who? Steve Vai is a Mick Mars fan. So, you know, if Steve Vai's got your back, I'm I'm cool with you. <laughs> yeah, no kidding, right? Yeah. He's a he's a like otherworldly player. It's crazy. Yeah. But back to the US festival, I mean it's 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 not a shocker to tell anybody that, you know, Vince Neil was a mess at that. You know? <laughs> he was a dork. That story, that the stupid rambling thing about being at the bar and then the, <laughs> there was a girl who came up and wanted to sleep with the whole band. What the hell would you do that for? Yeah. Like, it was just idiotic. I was thinking, like, is this guy really drunk? Or, like, what is the deal? It yeah. was really, really bad. Yeah, it was a bad, bad performance from him. And, you know, it's funny because if you think about that, that was their, like, that was a make or break for them because that was their first massive crowd, really. Shout out the Devil had just, I don't even think it was out yet. I think they were performing it. Um, but, like, that could have easily tanked them. You know, they could have been done. And Tommy Lee reportedly cried backstage and said, this is it. I'm done. That's right. Like, career's over. I'm finished. Yeah. Yep. And then what did Vince Neil do backstage? Do you guys know? The A&R guy's girlfriend. He did. <laughs> he did. Tom Zutat. <laughs> Slept with, he He uh, he brought Tom Zutat's girlfriend into uh, a dark corner and had his way with her. That's a fact. The dirt. They could have completely tanked their entire career from multiple directions in one night. Yeah. But see, a lot of people say that was the magic behind Motley Crue, right? Because they just, they didn't... Uh, and maybe that's that's why they were so successful. I don't know, you know. Maybe that was it. Who knows? Yeah, but you know, I know, I know I've talked to Mike about this, but and you basically look at Motley Crue's been going for over forty years now, and how much really recorded output do they did they really do? Really, not much. A lot of greatest hits. Yeah. Wow. Wow. yeah. Now you really could make crazy. one good Motley Crue out album, maybe half a good Motley Crue album, mm. uh, out of the bonus tracks from those greatest hits, but that's it's you know declining returns towards the uh the later greatest hits albums, as far as I'm concerned. Decade of Decadence was great. Yeah. But anything, you know, starts to decline a little bit after that and get the ill-fated Randy Castillo album, and then mm, yeah, what is it just Saints of Los Angeles after that? I, you know, that's I'm a good question. Sure. Uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm unfamiliar during that period because I know Generation Swine, 
Um, but like, I don't know. I, I wasn't paying attention. I, I didn't pay attention, to be honest with you, after Girls, 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 really. I had feel good. But like I was when Motley Crue came out. So just really quickly, like I, I remember getting a uh, hip raider mm-hmm. at uh, this this convenience store and I was flipping through it outside. I can see this in my mind. And I saw the uh, Motley Crue ad for Shout at the Devil, right? And and you guys remember what that looks like, right? It's a, it, it was, it's a music to tame the savage beast. And it was like, there was blood, there was fire, there was leather, there was hair, there was like, everything was there. And I was like, who the hell is this? Like, this is my thing right here. This is what I want. I'm in a small town and I'm like, I got it. Where is this thing? I got to find it. This is my new band. And I bought Shout at the Devil and it never came off my system. Like I, I just played the hell out of that thing. And then I bought Too Fast for Love, which I also, also liked. And then Theater Pain came out and I was like, I don't know, man. This is, where this is like a bunch of recycled kind of Aerosmith riffs. And then that was it for me. I liked it. Did you? <laughs> it's okay. It's well, fun. You know, you know, the thing is with, with Theater Pain, it's like you said, it's recycled Aerosmith uh, riffs and no better point to that than the opening track city boy city boy blues, blues yeah <laughs> but yeah. for me if you you take off smoking in the boys room um home sweet home was good but it just i just got tired of hearing it but stuff like keep your eye on the money save our souls louder than hell uh city boy blues i you know what tonight uh you know i i like that record now i you know when i say that i don't i like too fast for love were the two albums that came previous to it much better yes. but yeah. theater pain you know like um i seen that one about a year ago in a used record shop here and i didn't have a problem picking it up mm. so you know it for me i guess it's just that nostalgia where my head was at back in 85 right like it totally all agree boils down like to me i can we can finish this up and i could go listen to keep your eye on the money right now i love that one so you know i guess it's just like i like it better than girls 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 you know, nostalgia, Deke, is a very powerful, powerful concept, right? Mm-hmm. I listen to some really lousy records, you know, now because of nostalgia. And, and, and that's just, that's how it is, right? It, it compels you. Yeah. I, I still listen to Kiss and some of those records are not, <laughs> not that good. Dude, and the same, <laughs> right? But when I was a kid, Kiss was everything, you know? Kiss were gods in my mind, and that stays with you. You know, they they you, you make um, decisions based on um, your emotions being tweaked as a kid, and that's a powerful concept, man. Yeah, totally. And you you never sure. you never get away from that. Yeah. Power to the music in the streets. That's Karabi era. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, had to, go there. had to go there, but um, you know. Um, just to finish up here, yeah, mm. I mean, this whole Matthew Tripe thing, I mean, he he was just one messed up dude, and it's, I mean, it really, you know, spiraled out of control for the guy, and I know yeah. um, the other night, I actually went on YouTube and punched in the name Matthew Tripe, and just for people out there, if you want to check out what he did, there's some demos of his band called Six Pack. <laughs> oh, yeah, that was after the crew thing, yeah. Yeah, and it's, it's. Yeah, you know what, people, I'm not going to comment on it one way or the other. Just if you really want to, you could go check it out. And, uh, you know, it's got 900 views. Mm. (laughs) I think you just did comment on it, (laughs) Deke. You kind of (laughs) did. Well, it took me up until now to really think about YouTubing Matthew Tripe. So I don't think a lot of people even know. So. Yeah, you know, it's just too bad. He was just a messed up guy and, and got into a, a world of hurt and, uh, you know, but Hey, it made for a, a great little conversation between the three of us tonight. And, um, well, well I, n- I never did ask you guys like, what, where do you stand on this issue? Do you, do you believe it? Do you not believe it? Do you kind of believe it? You know what, Brent, you said something earlier tonight and I was just in- inside myself. I was like, right on. Cause that's what I want to believe. And you, what you said was, I think it's possible that he might have been brought in on a, in a limited scale, maybe a couple of gigs. And that's kind of where my mind is. So I'm yeah. really glad that you said that. Oh, yeah. No, I, I do. I do think that is the case. I, I kind of feel like that because those pictures, man, like the, uh, you look at those things like. And why is he in a picture with Richard Fisher? Like in that costume? 
There's right. no Photoshop. To your point, Mike, there's no Photoshop back then. Was that I, was he in a Motley Crue tribute band and the tour manager happened to be there that night? Highly unlikely. And in that picture, he's wearing those, you know, those glasses that Nikki Six used to wear that kind of look like ski goggles almost. Yeah. Right? He's wearing those. And then he with the in the picture with Richard Fisher. And then he's wearing those on the street in a t-shirt and jeans with his girlfriend and his baby. He's wearing the same glasses. Huh. It looks like. Like it's it's just, I don't know, man. I think there might be something to it. Hmm. What would you where I stand, oh. yeah, where I stand with it would probably be uh, your point on like some questions, like, well, first of all, the the pictures, like a picture says a thousand words at times, mm -hmm. and also the the publishing angle. How do you yeah. explain that? Well, yeah. I mean, you, you can't explain that. Maybe it was somebody else's decision. I don't know, but I don't know why he would do that. Like, I, and what about Nikki Six music? Like, does that? What happened to that? Just, I don't know. See, that's it's 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 up for debate, right? That's right. Totally up for debate. Mm -hmm. so, I want to thank you guys for uh, hopping on with me tonight. You're very welcome. It was my pleasure, as always, to be a part of this, and, uh, and uh, it's a privilege, man. Thank you. Mark, appreciate it. Uh, thanks for the support, buddy. And uh, you know, everybody, hit up uh, Brent Jensen Music. I mean, you still got your uh, Patreon page going. Yeah, I do as well thank you yes and um the three three books that we can still get and before i let you go you know probably where i'm going with this in regards to book number four uh, eventually it will see the light of day i was uh on facebook you know they they get those those memory share things right yeah, yeah i love those and typically i i don't i don't want to like you know kind of overload people with all this stuff but I, I saw that one that was really cool and it was a it was a book signing that i had done when i think leftover people was out and it was uh sean kelly yeah it was martin popoff and and brian volmer was there too and the four of us kind of sat there together and signed books in uh, guelph um at the chapters and that was a lot of fun man so i'll tell you i'll tell you deke like i'm looking forward to those days um and getting back out there so if that's any indication, then book four might be on the way. Book tour. There you go. <laughs> T-Bay. T-Bay. So uh, before I let you go, Brent, I got a couple of questions here I have to throw up on the screen. So if you could answer them sure. quickly, if you don't mind. Of course. Happy to. Why would they cover it up? Um, well, because I think that they wanted the momentum of the band to continue and they didn't want to have to answer for it um i don't know can i answer that sure same reason the beatles covered up paul mccartney's absence <laughs> oh conspiracy. i'm just joking just joking. opp <laughs> uh i don't know i mean again why wouldn't you cover it up though you know just think about doc mcgee doc mcgee imported like fifty thousand dollars worth of marijuana into the u.s and thought he could get away with it so like maybe that's the answer right? he, was, he, was, he, was, he was charged for that yeah. yes he was he the moscow music peace festival be, be, was part of the deal that uh, In, indeed yeah yeah that's for sure and one more from chris Thank you. Great show, guys. Oh, thank you, sir. Chris, I appreciate that. Thank, thank you very much. I have to apologize to the people. I, For some reason, the chat was disabled on YouTube, so my apologies. I'll have to look into that. I don't know what happened. Who knows? And, uh, yeah, thanks to everybody who decided to join us tonight. I totally appreciate it. And just to let you know, a week from tonight, I have Kevin and Sarah coming on, and we're going to talk about Canadian music since Kevin's uh, blog buried on or sorry Canadian, Canadian groups it focuses primarily just on Canadian records so we're going to get into a bit of uh, Canada rock and then on April 20th which is a Wednesday 6 p.m. start I have Martin Popoff coming on talking oh. about his Judas Priest book yeah I love so speak, speak of the devil yeah there we go i should have saved it when you were talking about it but <laughs> a little flow here tonight buddy <laughs> and in one hour we get to watch some thursday night record club that's right oh yeah so so now i i what time is it uh eight o'clock so we go on at nine and then we shoot a new episode at 10. 
So yeah. You're busy awesome tonight. Work. Yeah, no, it's a great night. I love that. Right. Awesome. Kind of moving around. So yeah, cool. it's going to be, I think you guys, the, the episode, I'm not going to spoil it, but the episode we do tonight will be near and dear to both of your hearts. Yes. Yes. Yeah, and it will be, I believe in, in like a month, but I can't, it's an artist that you both love. Oh, oh, oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. Come on. No pressure, man. These guys, these, guys, uh, these guys make it easy for me. The fact that they <laughs> want to come on with me, that's uh three quarters of the battle right there, man. Hey, <laughs> hey, hey man. Andy Kern, Sean Kelly. <laughs> Frank uh, Fraser. Yeah. Nicholas Fraser. Walsh. Nick Walsh. Yeah. I wonder if Nick's watching. I gotta get Nick on the podcast. He was so awesome, man. Yeah, I he saw I, awesome. I want I know I saw he was fantastic. Oh. And you know I, what? I'll 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 just tell you guys a quick story about Nick Walsh. Like when I was reaching out to him, I mean, he didn't know me from a hole in the ground. So I, I sent him a couple of my YouTube shows. I think I sent the one that, you know, we did, bef uh, I did with Brent with Triumph, you know, kind of name drop some guys that I've had on. And uh, the other one was obviously with uh, Andy Curran. And um, so, you know, he, he agreed to come on and, you know, we're shooting emails back and forth. And so, you know, once I told him, I said, you know, I'm I'm from Thunder Bay. Your bass player originally was from Thunder Bay. Right. Yeah. You know, we know the story about him demolishing the limo. I said, you know, we really don't have to go there. If yeah. I don't know the guy. Okay. So, like, I'm talking Patrick Howard, the bass player. So, we can totally skirt it if you want. And I'm totally cool with that because, you know, I don't want anybody to be put on the spot. Like, hey, what about that? Because he's talked about it a million times. Yeah. Right. And uh, so we're doing the show and he said, he brought it up and he said, see, Deke, you thought I wouldn't bring it up, but I'm bringing it up and <laughs> oh. you're not telling me to bring it up. So he, he talked about it, but he, he did it graciously. So, you know, it was, uh, yeah. he was, he was a great chat and, and I mean, he had great stories and it was just a free flow and uh, yeah, great guy. You should, you should get him. Tell him that uh, Deke sent you. I will for sure. Well, he might, he might be watching right now. If he's watching, I, I'm going to really quickly, I'm going to tell you a very cool uh, uh, Nick story. Sure. So um, I met him at uh, a, the recording of Metal on Ice, Sean oh, Kelly. Cool. You know, so you guys know that he recorded that CD. Yeah. Listen to uh, it all the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it was great. So, so fantastic afternoon. Nick was kind of the master of ceremonies. He pre produced it. And he had everybody come in and do their takes. Like, uh, you know, Darby Mills was there. Brian Vollmer was there. Lee Aaron was there. Of course, Sean Kelly was there. And it was just like a great time, right? And that was, I, I, I think that was the first time I met Nick. And super good guy. And so I reached out to Nick and I said, because uh, he, he, I think he read No Sleep Till Sudbury. I, no, I gave it to him. That's what it was. I, I gave him a copy. And I saw him a little while later at a show. And, uh, I said, um, what'd you think? And he's like, I don't know. I really liked it. Thanks. You know, and he sent me a really nice note. And I said, uh, can you take a picture of yourself with the book that I can use kind of just for social media? And I'll, I'll like, I'll, I'll send you a case of beer. Like I'll give you, you know, I just wanted to like look after him. Right. And he's like, dude, I'd be happy to do that. Don't worry. You know, next time I see you at a show, buy me a beer. Who cares? And I was like, you're the coolest man. Like I love Slick Toxic when I was like, no, really? Like I, when I was a kid, like Slick, he was, he was Canada's answer to Guns N' Roses back then. If you guys remember, that's yeah, what they're sure. calling him, right? Yeah, yeah. Canada's answer to Axl Rose. And he is a fantastic guy. Love him. So yeah, yeah. I, got, I, got, I got to get him on the podcast. Yeah. You got to hit him up because uh, he's got great stories. And I, I told him, I said, you know what? We can go as long as you want. You can go a half hour. And go an hour. We ended up almost going ninety minutes with him. An hour and a half. Yeah. yeah and I, and I, I told him. I told him at an hour. I said, "Well, you know, Nick, we're at an hour." He goes, "What? You don't want to hear my stories anymore?" We said, no, "I keep going. I just don't want to push cool. the. I just don't want to push it." You know. So uh, yeah, he was super good. I mean, I, I just been lucky with everybody and yeah. you know, uh, everybody that comes on with us or myself or whatever. And uh, it's just been. Well, you're doing something right, man, because we stick around. We're coming back, especially, you know, those guys, right? The Curran's been on a couple of times. So I think Deke and I together have talked to Curran five or six times altogether. Yeah. That's awesome. And, uh, that's, that's a yeah. big deal. That's a big deal. He, you know, he's got stuff to do, right? Yeah. 
Uh, so, yeah, he's totally got stuff to do. I mean, he doesn't have to talk to some Yahoo in Thunder Bay, but he, he does, and I certainly appreciate it. <laughs> that's a credit to their characters as well. True. Right? He, he yeah. and Kelly and Nick and, and awesome. Phrase. So, you know, we're blessed, right? Because these, these are guys who maybe were on our, our walls when we were kids, and now we get to talk to them. So we're lucky. Yeah, With any luck, I'll be meeting Andy and Sean in two weeks when Coney Hatch hit, hit Waterloo. There you go. Got my That's tickets. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, got my tickets. Going to be seeing the hatch. Nice, nice, nice. great, great time and great band. But anyway, I don't want to keep Brent on too much longer because he's got a go get ready ready. busy Thursday night. But thanks, Brent. And you know what? Um, I'm probably, I'm probably, I'm actually getting Alex on in May on here. Yeah, so. he told me that. Yeah, he, just, so. he texted. He texted me. I didn't want to. <laughs> That's pretty cool. I yeah, know. and I and I I told him I said. He said, he goes, I'm not like schooled in the heavy rock like you guys are. And I said, no, <laughs> it, it's about, I told him I want to focus our time on his deal yeah. mm. and his his platform on him promoting artists and, and whatnot. And uh, so I think it'll be pretty cool. It'll be something I'll even learn because, you know, he's, he's pretty passionate about, he sent me a bunch of his stuff he was doing and I couldn't believe all the the new release day stuff that he's he's doing and talking to all these artists and it was like wow you know i thought he was just a i just thought he liked to show up on thursday nights and drink <laughs> but you know there's a lot more uh substance so, well, there's, uh, there's a lot more going on underneath yeah, yeah he's yeah. not just some he's not just some young boozer who gets drunk and <laughs> so, so you know definitely down the road man we'd love to uh have you back on and we'll we'll, we'll figure something out I always appreciate you taking time just to spend uh a bit of your evening with us so you know yeah, what man. have a good night and definitely check out brent at nine o'clock thursday nights thursday night record club on youtube check brent out at brent jensen music on patreon instagram twitter face crack all uh, of it he's he's everywhere man so you know what hit <laughs> him up man and and Support local. Hey, yay. Thank you, boys. Thank you very much. I Thank appreciate you. it. It's All been right. a pleasure. Care, guys. Thanks for your support. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Take care. All right, All man. Right, take buddy. care. Ciao. Well, we've got to end the broadcast here.